Welcome to the Mental Health Advocacy Series. We're back with another great conversation this week. The focus of this series is mental health and the Black community. With this series, it has been our desire to share information with the community on topics such as understanding what mental health is, myths and stigmas about mental health, generational trauma, therapy and other resources, barriers to help, and much more. Today, we will be talking about mental health resources and its barriers. I'm Surprise Parker, and I serve as a trauma-informed education coordinator with Greater Richmond Scan. I am a native of Newport News, Virginia, and I'm married to my wonderful husband. I have two children, my 12-year-old son, Caden, and my four-year-old daughter, Kaylee. Today, I'm joined by my wonderful colleague, Tamika Daniel, who is the Behavioral Health Community Organizer for Greater Richmond Scan. Tamika is an East End community resident and a mother of four children. She began, began advocating for the needs of her son who has autism, which ultimately, ultimately excuse me, led her to advocating on a larger scale in the 10 years of not being employed. She began as SCAN's Behavioral Health Community Organizer in August of 2019 through a partnership with Richmond Memorial Health Foundation. Utilizing her expertise and experience, she brings, brings SCAN's work in adverse childhood experiences, better known as ACEs, trauma and resilience to the community through training and forums. She also assists in building resilience and facilitating healing through empowerment and connection through a trauma-informed and equity lens. Additionally, she brings her voice, and advocacy to all meetings and tables throughout the community in which she serves. I also have the pleasure to introduce to you today our very special guests, Ms. Shamir Miles and Ms. Ivy Bell. Shamir Miles is the Family and Community Engagement Liaison with Peter Paul Development Center. Shamir is often referred to as a bridge between the programs at Peter Paul and the community. You can find Shamir often engaging with neighbors while leading community walks throughout the East End. Ms. Ivy Bell is a certified community health worker resource specialist at the VCU Health Hub at 25th Street. I'm so glad that they have joined us today. In our conversation, myself, Shamir, Ivy, and Tamika will be talking to you or amongst ourselves about mental health resources and some of the barriers that exist when trying to access those resources within the Black community. So let's jump right in. So I'll start, we'll have a series of questions. I'm going to start with my first one. And so I'm wondering when when you think about mental health, what are some resources that may be available in general? And let's start with Ms. Ivy. When, in general, I would think that most communities in the housing area always know about the in-home, the in-home services, the mental health skill building services that the councils come out. Um, in the East End, we have Con, who do they have mental health help there. Um, recently, I found out that Planned Parenthood on 25th Street also offers those services, as well as Daily Planet and VCU. Thank you. Those are some really good um, options, especially here um, in the East End. Shamir, what do you think about when we think about mental health um, and some of the resources that may be available in general? Um, thank you for that lovely introduction. And I want to say good afternoon to all of the beautiful women on this panel. Um, and thank you to everyone who will watch this either now or later. Um, but when I think of mental health services, I'm going to speak specifically for the community that I live in, the community that I work in, and the community that I play in, which is the Eastern of Richmond. Um, I think of peer-to-peer -peer support, um, whether it's our neighbors, our friends, 
we're often like the frontline workers to when someone is experiencing trauma, when someone is experiencing just a hard time, day-to-day life challenges, you, you're you most likely to go to a neighbor, a relative, a trusted source, someone you have a relationship with prior to reaching out. So in the work that I do, I like to arm people like myself and others who are kind of like identified as those first points of contact with additional resources because again people may not always go to an agency first they go to a trusted person who they have a relationship with and if that person entails has the tools and resources that they can access then they'll be more likely to trust that source um, when they need it thank you so much shamir thank you Um, Yeah, when I think about in general, like the main thing that comes to my mind is always therapy. Like that's like the main thing when you think about mental health in general, it's just that therapy, like just me speaking from experience before I started working, I didn't know of any other resources outside um, of that for mental health because it was never a big issue where I was from. Um, the same for me in terms of mental health resources, especially when I think about, you know, just growing up and the stigma about therapy. I knew that therapy was a thing, but mental health resources were just really your family when I think about how it was growing up and how you keep things inside. But now that I am older and I know the things that I know, I would definitely agree with you to me that therapy is what immediately pops into my mind therapy and talking about what what we're going through. Thank each of you for um, sharing on that. Um, As we prepare to get into our next question, um, I invite you to respond. What do these resources look like in the Black community? Mm -hmm. And let's go with Ivy. My honest opinion, I don't really believe a lot of the resources that I name are helpful. True, they are in the community. Um, I definitely never recommend in-home services, um, especially because technically a lot of them aren't for mental health technically. They they have a job. Um, Most they do is take them out to the store or maybe the run errands. That's not, I mean, that's true what the community need. They always need somebody to take them, but technically are you helping them is my question for that. Um, Like everywhere else, a lot of the places that I named have a waiting list or they're not accepting new, new clients at the moment. And that's because a lot of people are, are a plan for mental health. I feel like, the people, some of the people that are receiving help need the help versus that some people are looking for to get a check, are receiving the the, the services. And now that um, it's really hard to get in-home services now because you have to be truly ill or pretty much close to killing yourself but even receive those services. And yeah, that's what I had. But I don't, I, I don't know securely about how Planned Parenthood works with this. Shamir, what do you think these resources look like in the Black community? I would say I, I, I don't know how to identify them in my Black community. I know they exist outside of my community and we have people who agencies that will come into the community for specific clients or, or referrals. If I could think of, if I needed someone to connect directly tomorrow morning to a mental health service in my community, I think I would struggle with identifying who's doing what. I'm sure there may be people here, but it is not a heavy prevalence as you may see in another community or how advertised. And I think it, it, it speaks to the stigma around 
Black Mental Wellness. Um, I think you you mentioned a little bit of it, surprise. Um, in, in our culture, there's a stigma of we don't talk about what's going on in home, in our lives, in public. We don't share things that we go through. And I think that that has a tribute to not having as many resources as needed because no one knows that we experience some of the challenges that we experience. I know over the past probably five to six years, a lot of stuff had, a lot of research has went into children in school. So we're starting to see a lot more resources inside of the school. But however, these resources don't translate to directly in the community after five, after eight, 12 o'clock at night. When, when, when things are happening, we have to wait until someone comes into the community um, to get to render services, or you have to navigate how do you get out of your community to get services um, delivered to you or, or whomever you need them for. Um, just to piggyback um, off of what you're saying, um, pretty much that's what the resources look like in our communities. They're pretty much non-existent. Um, I almost feel like if you aren't attached to an agency who are like giving you actual resources, then you're not going to know. Like I know some of the resources that I was given only came from because I was attached to say like RBH or something like that. But then even still, I didn't feel like that was catered to exactly what my child needed. So it's like, again, um, what you said earlier, Shamil, a lot of the times what the resources look like in our community is talking to our neighbors, sitting on the front porch, um, how we do, and just talking. That seems to be like the, the main sources or resources that we have in these communities. Like you have to go outside or either like Abby said, the stuff that they do have, it's not tailored for the needs of the people that's in these communities. So um, that's why I like having these conversations <laughs> so we can actually, you know, address these issues. Could I add one more piece, please? Definitely. Um, I, think, I think also um, the services that are, are available because we, they are available, sometimes often lack the cultural sensitivity piece that should be there, even just the cultural differences awareness. Um, historically, even in our, as an African-American woman, historically, even in my genetic my DNA, my makeup, there's some, some predetermined things about me that I may even be unaware of. Um, and if I don't identify or understand these, then that, that puts a barrier between me and anything else. And I think if someone is trying to authentically help me, even understanding that there's some cultural, some genetic things, there's, there's a lot of factors to connecting with me, just, just understanding that there is multi-layered. It's not a one size, one situation fits all. The way you help my family would not be the way you help Tanika's family. And that's okay, but just understanding that we all have, um, it, it's, it's multi-layers of how you engage with someone and, and not just moving over that. We, we, we have some historical trauma. Um, we have some Again, I'm just going to use the, the, the language, just multi-layer and it's compl compl complex. Um, but I think that if the right people want to address these and they're willing to be educated upon those, you know, how do I, how do I help someone but be respectful to their culture um, to be able to better help them out, if that makes sense? It makes perfect sense. Thank you so much to each of you for sharing. Um, I also think that um, these resources as it relates to the black community that um, a lot of these things are outpriced for us. And so there are many black families who do not qualify for Medicaid. And so some of those common resources that many of our children are pushed towards, you know, um, the supports in the school, um, day support, um, those that are in the school and you have to have Medicaid for those. I, for instance, my son needed some supports early on in elementary and we did not have Medicaid and we could not afford 
to have to to pay the day support people inside the building and so that was not something that was available to my family and it was something that my son definitely needed in his time um and he could have benefited from having someone to support and to feel cared for in that building but it wasn't something that was available because we were the in-between and so you know it's it, it becomes that way that well, if you're not in this category, then you don't get this, which sometimes is the bare minimum. And then if you're in this category, then you don't get anything. Um, and so a lot of times the resources are really hard to access. Even when I think about, can't remember which one of you mentioned it, but just like, I think Tamika said it, what you have had to experience to qualify for the mental health support as an adult, being hospitalized and you know, those those types of um, qualifications that you need to meet, that there has to be um, a fire before you can have water. Um, and we shouldn't have to have a fire before we can get some support. We could see the smoke before the fire and be able to save, but, but that's not always provided for the Black community, in my experience. I've had that same instance happen um, in my in my household. Um, my son received therapeutic day treatment um, in his elementary school for two years straight. And when we switched him from Medicaid to private insurance, he was immediately dropped. And for kids, they don't understand that, you know, prices, they don't understand how insurance works. They just understand that this great person who I'm building a relationship with is now another person who's removed out of my care. Um, and it's, 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 you, you often hear in meetings of the work that we all do as the women that we are, we're in, we're in a lot of great meetings and we hear about hundreds and thousands of resources. And we've all probably been on the end of needing some of those resources as well. And it's not just as easy as the person who manages these, manages the services, rolls out the services, um, advertises the services. It's not as easy as they think it is for the person who needs them to connect to them. You often, there's often income restrictions. There are, there's often where kids can age out of things. There's often, um, it's, it's a lot of criteria to meet some of these, to meet some of these programs. Um, so that's, that, that's another layer between the, the programs that are designed to help and the people who need those um, often sometimes don't even meet the criteria to be able to utilize those services. Exactly. And we, of course, as the conversation goes on, we kind of tip into some things that we will talk further about, um, but we'll touch back on them. Um, but thank you each for um, your feedback and your input because it really um, is encouraging, you know, and allows people to kind of know, yeah, I'm not the only one feeling this. Um, and so our next question is, do you feel that there is a lack of resources and supports to the Black community? And we'll start with Tamika this time. Um, no doubt about it. That's why um, I wanted to um, create this platform because um, it really is a lack of resources. Um, like I was saying a little bit earlier, like unless you're tied to something like Shamir was saying, like they doing better in the school system, but what about the children who can't access um, those things through the school? Or what about the children who don't have IEPs who need services? Like it seems like the children who do get ben certain benefits and are able to get those benefits, it has to be something tied in with it. And like Shamir was saying, like, why can't a parent um, say for themselves or even their child that look, hey, this is what I'm experiencing. I, I don't know how to manage. I don't know how to cope. Cause that's where a lot of distress and depression comes from. It's not, they need medication. It's not that they just, you know, want to sit and wallow. They don't have coping skills. So it just builds up and builds up and builds up instead of them being able to go to their doctor and saying, hey, look, um, I'm having a hard time managing the stuff that's going on in my life. And it's like, for me, like, you know, I've been used to the system a little bit. So I know how to kind of word my words to, you know, get certain results. But what about the people who don't know and they go in there and you trying to confide in your doctor to get some help and they throw you a prescription? 
that doesn't address the need. That just mask it. So it's like, what what do people do? Well, what are they going to do when there's just a complete lack of resources? Unless you tie to something or something is already wrong with you. Thank you so much, Tamika. You made me think about the lack of resources and, and how limited they are, but also like how to find out about them makes me think. So there are only a few, but then, you know, the lack of the information on those resources so that they are not tapped. Ivy, any thoughts? It, repeat it one more time because I don't want to say it wrong. Can you repeat the question? Absolutely. Do you feel that there are a lack of resources and supports in the Black community? It is. It's, it's most definitely is. I work in the I work in the church here community. I work in Wickham and I work here on 25th Street. And I know it is. Regardless of what I can name that should be here to help the community, does not mean that it is the that is gonna help the community. Um you can go, like you say, you can go to the doctor and tell them, and if you don't know how, what to be said, it's just a prescription to be read, or it's, oh, well, make an appointment with this person, and you'll see. Um, it's a lot of, if you don't have insurance, where do you get the help from if you don't qualify for Medicaid? Um, and then it is hard just to find, even if some places don't take certain health insurance, whether you have health insurance, um, just because they have Medicaid. Some people might have Virginia Premier. Oh, well, we don't take Virginia Premier. We don't take Anthem. We don't take Optima. Then it's just finding the help. And then you find the help and to find out where is help that you know it can help you to help the residents. It's hard. It's hard. It's just, it's hurtful because I do the work to try to find people mental health help. And it's hard to say, oh, I have a counselor and you didn't call the counselor for two and three days and you haven't heard from them. Or they need to make a therapy appointment because they missed the appointment because they don't have a way there. Or it's just a lot. Like it's a lack in the community. I feel like I wish I could just change it like that, <laughs> but it's definitely a lack. And I feel like the black community is definitely forgotten about when it comes to mental health. It just rolls me the wrong way. I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Abby. I definitely can see that it has really evoked, you know, some emotion in you, which evokes emotion in me too, because oftentimes. Um, the lack is because that there is not a need that's recognized. And when we start there, that we don't need or we are less than what others are, then that does create lack. When you don't identify with me, that there is a need for me. Shamir, what do you think um, about it? Are there lacks of resources? and supports available to the Black community? I would say there's gaps. There are supports and um, you can find resource guidebooks, you can hear um, advertisement, you can, again, in the work that we all do, we, we hear various agencies. Um, but as a frontline worker, as a person who lives and works in the same community, those services are not here as anchor institutions. They are not, and again, they lack that, the ones that do come in lack that cultural humility piece, the sensitivity piece, they understand that, uh, again, back to those layers of even addressing the historical trauma, not coming in saying, hey, you know, it was my fault, it's my agency fault, you're traumatized, I'm not saying that, but, but, understanding that even in for some of us there's a stigma about identifying with I have any issues going on um 
Some people may feel it's a sign of weakness. I should be able to maintain my house, my marriage, my kids, my community, and hold it all intact. I should be able to run back off to the school four and five times and still keep my full-time job and pay all of my bills and make sure everybody's fine. That may be some people's truth, but some people need assistance with managing day-to-day tasks. And it should not be fear of a consequence if I say, hey, I'm struggling in this area. I'm struggling with managing my kids. I'm struggling with managing my health. I'm struggling with paying my bills. Um, That whole fear of what happens next is true. And I I think the Black mental health has a lot of different pieces as well. You have the women, you have our men, and then you have our children. And we all handle it differently. Historically, the black woman can handle enough, enough, you know, so many things and she's looked at to be just this resilient human being. Our kids, we're starting to see our kids now because they're they're most likely to be diagnosed now that it's a new normal, you know, to be diagnosed, you know, in through school and other ways that, you know, as a in my age, it wasn't even things, they didn't even have these tools to be able to make all these recommendations when I was in school. So we're often seeing a lot of these diagnoses in our children. However, our kids, you know, they, they go to school, they can receive some services in school, but what about the home and the community that the kids have to also be into? So I, I think that I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to say this, being open to the conversations, even what we're doing here now, speaking about it, not acting like it doesn't exist. Speaking about it, the more we speak about it, the more it becomes on someone's radar, and then eventually you'll have enough, you, you'll have enough momentum where you can actually start to see change. I think we have to change the mindset of people first before we can even get into changing policies. We have to, we have to kind of deprogram how we even are conditioned to think. Um, again, before we can even tap into like you know, because we can, we can go on. We know policies affect how we receive services, the lack of services, the appropriate services. But I think our mind is, is something that has to shift in our mindsets as well to even understand how to utilize these services, how to, how to navigate through these services, how to pick appropriate services, um, but also how to, how to reach out when you um, don't qualify for those. But what do you do next? You're absolutely right. Thank you so much, Shamir. Um, sharing so many wonderful points. Um, I appreciate each of you. And we know that in life, there are barriers to so many things, and especially in minority communities, such as we represent the minority. um, What are some barriers or possible barriers that we know or see um, to obtaining mental health supports and resources? What are some barriers that exist there? And um, we'll start with Shamir, you can pick it up there. I would say the, the fear of the stigma of identif- one identifying with, I need these services. Um, some people may feel like it's a, a, you're, you're feeling defeated. You're feeling you've let something down. You couldn't handle something. You were supposed to be able to manage all these expectations. It's a fear and stigma you know, if I reach out for help, what would my community think? What would my, what would others around me think? Um, I think that this, this, I think the the huge stigmas that are still attached to um, reaching out for mental health support, just being mentally well, there's still a huge, huge, a lot of stigma around that, and I think that creates fear uh, for people to even reach out. Thank you so much. Um, I agree with you. And I also believe that in terms of like barriers to obtaining mental health resources in the minority communities, that systemic racism plays a part in those barriers. Um, The politics play a major part in that. Again, many of those resources are not even made available um, to our communities. And when they are, they are minimal. And so those create barriers. Um, for our people, also just transportation, lack of lack of knowledge. You know, some things we some things we just don't know, and so those are some barriers that um, I think about. Tamika, 
How are you feeling? What do you think about the barriers um, that are present to obtaining mental health supports and resources? Um, just digging a little deeper into what you say, because I'm actually experiencing it right now, and we touched on it somewhat, is that the lack of, quote unquote, not having a diagnosis, not going to them with, oh, um, something wrong with me, you know, I, I'm depressed, I'm stressed, um, or either for me, I was going to therapy for three years. The only way I was able to get that is because I was a domestic violence victim. That was the only way it was available to me. And I was going through some things. So I went in there and played like, yeah, I could use some um, therapy. But again, what about the people who don't know how to, you know, kind of speak the way they need to, to get the results that they desire. And then it's like, now they felt like I made so much progress. I was discharged from the program, but I'm a single mom of four children. One has autism, one has ADHD. And all four of them got IEPs. I work a full-time job and I'm hands-on in a lot of stuff. So what about me just needing that outlet so that I don't go down a rabbit hole? I'm having a hard time now trying to find those services. I was given, when I went to my doctor, I was given a list of two doctors and it was like, you may need to call and see if they accept your insurance or I don't know how much it's going to cost. So it went from being free if something was wrong with me to if I'm coming to you just saying I need help coping to, well, we don't know how much it's going to cost. We don't know if your insurance is going to cover it. Like, that's not, that's not okay. Thank you, Tamika. You're so right. Ivy, would you like to share on this question? I do. Um, like Tamika, I play a big, uh, mental health plays a big part in my life. Um, I was diagnosed with um, major depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. True. I work a full-time job. I, I still get up in the morning. And because like they think, and like they think that you're okay, you dismiss from charge, you dismiss from services and stuff. I still need somebody to talk to, or then you try to find services and you're treated like you're just trying to get medicine. I, I have never been so irritated with something like that in my life because it's not just me that I've heard it happen to. You try to find things that's recommended in the community and they treat you like, they just give you these medicines and that's what it is. Like, you're like, wait, that's not what I need. I need you to help me or to feel like you're talking to a therapist that's sad at you like, whatever, just go ahead and let's get this over with. Um, so if this happened to me, I can only imagine what happens to the people, other people that still trying to get to a better place. Now, is not easier to get services when I needed. For me, I realized I didn't, everybody don't have the counselors I had before I was discharged, where they made sure that I was okay, even if it's just a phone call. It's just, I just, it just, it's just one over on me. I don't feel like nothing helps the community unless they're giving out drugs where they think it's a drug problem. So we're gonna give you some drugs to handle your drugs. Oh, if you, you have depression. Oh, we're just gonna give you these medicines that you're gonna sleep all day and you can't stand for yourself and your kids. Or it's, it's just hard. Like, and I hate it. I hate having to call for clients where I'm trying to find them help. And they are, it's just, I think the community has definitely been left in the dark and it only comes when they need numbers in a community. When it's halfway there, like you halfway giving people services or you just want people to show up, of course people are turned off from it. So that's my thought about it. it um it almost makes me think about something that one of you guys said earlier about that whole how they 
actually view black people like we so resilient um we done been through so much so it's like you know like the um, maternity issues that we're facing as um black women like our pain is not acknowledged like we tolerate pain we tolerate this at this level that ain't by choice that was by force to Mickey, you took the words out of my mouth that mine too <laughs> mine too i um i do um i also am a community researcher with bcu Central society and health and i work on uh, research studies um most of the research studies, they connect to the social determinants that directly impact our health, like housing, education, employment. You, you got to go through the list. Um, and, and just about out of every 200 and something research studies I've been a part of, when I'm having my conversations with participants, something, especially if, if they're African-American, something always comes out about the stigma associated to the connection to healthcare, the tr historical trauma, mistrust, misuse, abuse, those words come up so much. Um, and when that speaks to when I say understanding the multi layers that this is not just stuff that people make up. Um, un un unfortunately, before my time as a researcher, yes, unethical research has been done and has been done on certain populations. And that trauma, you can still feel to this day. You know, there's been a lot of um, um, mistrust with research studies that directly impact the African-American women. Um, so when you think about, you know, African-American women in, in the healthcare system and how they navigate it, how they even utilize it, how they even identify with, I'm gonna take better care of myself, is something that falls you know, second to taking care of others, because again, of a lot of that historical trauma that we might not even be aware of ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, it's just something inside of us that creates that fear. Uh, and those are the issues that we have to talk about. Those are the issues we have to make known. Um, because a lot of this stuff was even taking place before many of us were even born. But however, the policies and practices that are still in place, are dictating how we all um, go about our way of life still today. Exactly right, Shamir. Um, and you all said a couple things that, and one thing that I think stands out to me is it's another point that we ourselves are inadvertently a barrier because we are taught to put on the good face. And so much like myself, I have significant childhood trauma and yeah, no one will ever know. And always a smile, a stone cold face, but always a smiling face. And so no matter what's going on, we are taught that, yeah, I'm all right. Or I got, I have to be all right, especially Black women and Black women who have children or Black women who lead families that we don't have time to be down. We don't have time to, to break, to allow any of those resources to be available to us. I am so thankful for therapy um, because of the, the ways that I am learning about myself um, and, and the ways that I show up because of my experiences. But yes, we create some of our own barriers, not to our fault, but just lack, again, lack of knowledge, lack of those things being made available to us, which leads me into our next question. Um, when supports and resources are available, why do you feel that it may still be hard for some people to access them or that they they choose not to access them? I um, think, Abby, fear, oh. I'm sorry, I, I apologize. Uh, I think that that fear of treatment is it, it, not talked about. It is implied and it definitely happens um feeling treated less than Tamika spoke to something that I've I've heard a lot about women in like childbirth. Um when women when African American women express something such as pain, um is it taken seriously? Um why shouldn't it be? Uh I can't tell anyone that they don't have a toothache. So how can they tell me I don't have, you know, I'm not experiencing any kind of pain. 
um, the whole how we're stigmatized, um, how we how how some of us often show up um, is a barrier. Uh, of course, if you're in pain and you're frustrated, you're not going to look your best. You might not have your lashes on and your hair might not be curled the right way. But however, you shouldn't be treated as, you know, I'm, I'm just going to call it a nigga thing. Um, some, some people have been have experienced being treated as if they're an addict, that they're just there for prescriptions. Um, some people are, 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 are dismissed because of the way they show up, the way they look, the way they speak. Um, it's almost like you need a, an advocate for yourself in the healthcare system, um, someone who can vouch for you and speak for you um, so that you don't get stereotyped or pegged to be something that you're not, just to be able to access something that you you may depend heavily on, which is healthcare. Right, or that you just need. Correct. Um, another point too is that kind of back to what I just said in my previous response was that we have to put on a good face. And so admitting that I am struggling with my mental health may make me feel like a failure. And so because of that, I may not reach out for support or that I have to relive my trauma to get help or to admit that I, I was a, a victim or a survivor. I am a survivor of this thing. And it's hard to come to terms with, yeah, that did happen to me. And that I am not my experiences, um, which is what we will learn by utilizing the, these resources. Those are those weren't my decisions. I am not what happened to me, but I can be better than that. And so we don't really know that that's what's on the other side. And so we stifle ourselves from access and what's available. Um, Tamika, what do you think about um, why we don't access the resources that are made available or why it's hard to access them? Uh, for me personally, and I share this story all the time, and Shamir touched on it a little bit, is that that stigma that's attached um, when, you, when you're filling out an application and they see your address or they see your name or they see what you're coming in there asking for help with. And I tell this story all the time about when I first got my job and I hadn't worked in so long, I thought I was doing the right thing. I went to ask for bus tickets to get to work until I got my first paycheck from an organization that was placed in the um, neighborhood for this very reason. So again, this is a resource that's available and I know about it and I go there first person, I'm proud of you. She didn't know me. I felt like I was talking to my grandma, but she had to push it to someone else. And that very next day, it, it completely changed for me. This person made me feel like I was nothing, um, told me I had to provide receipts for what I spent my money on. And there's no reason I shouldn't have had money for these bus tickets, even though I'm thinking I done did good and got me a nice career going. This person just made me feel like scum. And I told myself I would never go back to that organization again. It's been almost three years and I have not been back to that organization again. So just wow. Wow. things like that, like stuff like that happens a lot. Some people will build up the strength to put our pride to the side because some of us can be prideful, you know, and then when we get to the point that we do put our pride to the side, because we, we got a goal in mind, then you have somebody that comes and it like it just sets you completely back. Um, that's another barrier that I've seen. Thank you, Tamika. Ivy, what, what do you think about this question? Why, why we are not quick to access the resources when they're available? Why it's difficult for us to access those resources? Like most times, most people you talk to, your neighbor who might be getting resources and like Tamika said, the person that you can go in there with great thoughts that you're doing great and then it's all it could be somebody there that's going to take you down to you. It's going to make you feel ashamed of yourself. You're going to make you feel like you shouldn't be asked for help. You Like you can go in there dress properly how you want to and they looking at you like what you need help for or you go in there because you left work, which work. I don't understand why you need help. Or, and sometimes we can be the problem. 
you scared to ask. You scared that you don't want nobody to look at you no other way other than, oh, they think I'm crazy. May let me not go over there. Or you may see people who have a mental health issue that people aren't helping. So I just agree with everything Tamika and Shamir said. Like I couldn't agree better to what they said. Thank you all. And we are getting ready to wrap up. And this is our last question for the evening. Um, what can we each do individually? Um, and what could we all do collectively to make sure that resources are shared and that our communities know that those resources exist? And so I, I'll start with um, individually, I can just continue to share out those resources that I get, being more intentional about where I'm sharing that information, um, taking that extra step to take it to, if I'm delivering it to one school, to deliver it to the school that's right next door. Um, and so that both schools that are in the same community, um, their families will know what's available as an example. Um, and then as a collective, I think just us coming together more and collaborating, not feeling like we are gatekeepers of the information that we have. Also something that shows up a lot in, in our communities. We like to hold on to things that we get, but just collectively working together and somehow communicating, you know, some type of resource tree and we know who to call on. Like, I know I can call Tamika for this um, and she's going to connect me to the right resource or the right connecting piece and that at the end, we all have a, a, a puzzle that's been put together. Um, Abby, what, do you, what are your thoughts on this? How we can work together individually and collectively to ensure that our communities know about these resources? Individually, share the information, you know, pretty much same thing, share the information. Be mindful of what information you're sharing with the, with the clients, with the community follow up with the people who you shared the resources with because they can tell you exactly how they feel or how it went. And just don't go by the one client who like may say, oh, well, I had a good time because another client had a good experience versus you might have 10 clients compared to that one that, didn't have, that have had bad experience. Collectively, I think we should continue to meet together, share the information, share your thoughts and your concerns about the resources that we are sharing to the community. Give the feedback that you received about the resources that you that we shared in the that was shared in the community. Thank you. Shamir. I would say um individually continue to live in my truth. Um, continue to reach out when I need help. To set that example to my kids, I'm raising two boys um, so that they know it's okay to reach out for help. It is okay to say that um, you're struggling with some things and not just push, continue to push forward because eventually it could snowball or, or become unmanageable. And collectively continue to use my privilege in, in my workspaces and in my relationships professionally to bring awareness to certain issues, um, but, uh, but collectively hold others accountable. Um, when Tamika mentioned going to an agency in our community who's designed to help, I work at an agency that's directly in my community that's designed to help. So I would never wanna be a person who is looked at as a gatekeeper of the resources. They are not my resources to give. I should not judge who I give them to. I should not feel like I, I have the power over who gets them and who don't get them. Um, I think I should advocate more for continued resources to come through our doors so that we can continue to give them out at a large volume and not have to turn anyone away because of, you know, a, a piece of red tape. Um, not judge help. Um, help doesn't have a, uh, a look. A person who works should could need help just as well as a person who doesn't work should need help. So I think we, I think I, I leave this with task at hand to, to do better. I appreciate you two ladies um, and scan for allowing 
um, to have these conversations because I know they're not easy. Um, sometimes we don't talk about these conversations because they can be re-traumatizing. They could trigger people. They could um, present even more challenges. But I, I think we're up for the challenge of, of having the conversation and working through them together um, to better serve ourselves and our, and our community. Tamika? Um, I will just um, go ahead and piggyback um, off of what Shamir was saying, just continuing to be the change that I want to see. Um, I'm very transparent, so um, just continuing to constantly advocate for myself and not keeping my mouth shut because I'm scared or fearful and things of that nature. And another one is making sure I know about resources because it's a lot of stuff that, you know, I have my moments where there's stuff that I didn't even know exists. I live in Churchill and I didn't know everything that Planned Parenthood had to offer. I didn't know everything that the VCU Health Hub had to offer. So how am I going to be able to help somebody else when I don't even, you know, know what's going on? So just doing a better job as an individual of knowing what's going on in my own backyard and collectively um, continuing to have these conversations, continuing to engage people to start the conversation. So then eventually the mindsets can change and then we can start talking about policy changes and things of that nature. So um, as long as I have my platform, some uh, access to some platform, whether it be with work, or uh, my personal Facebook page, y'all know me, y'all see me, I'm always posting something. <laughs> so just continuing um, to do that. And um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up for us. Um, I'm so thankful to you ladies for joining me um, on this conversation. And we've come to the end of our time. Thank you again, Shamir, Avi, and my lovely coworker, Surprise, for being a part of this conversation today. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you for all that you do in your professional and personal lives. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. We hope you found this conversation informative and encouraging. We will be back next week for the next conversation in the Mental Health Advocacy Series. Take care, and we look forward to staying connected with you.